know when you talk about food sovereignty, mm-hmm. we're talking about the farmer and the consumer being at the center. Are you wondering how you can learn more about food? Well, you're in the right place. This is the Chakula podcast brought to you by the Root to Food Initiative, a show that celebrates authentic Kenyan dishes and serves you hot conversations about food in Kenya from an economic, social and political lens. Semanasi kwenye social media at Root to Food on Instagram, at Root to Food on Twitter and Root to Food on Facebook. And now, here's your host, Felistas Mwalia. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chakula podcast. Today, we want to tackle a very critical part of our food reality, seeds and seed sovereignty. I'll be speaking to Sidi Otieno, member of the Kenyan Peasants League, a social movement of peasant farmers advocating for food sovereignty. Sidi has been at the forefront in advocating for better governance, transparency and seed sovereignty for the masses. It's his core belief that seed freedom works alongside political and economic freedom towards total emancipation. Karibu sana, Sidi. Sandi sana. Wow, where do we even start? <laughs> <laughs> Could you help us understand what seeds are out there and uh, who gets to control them and what mechanism governs the world of seeds? Yeah, thank you very much for welcoming me to this studio. Mm-hmm. Well, you find that uh, the global seed systems is controlled by multinational uh, institutional corporations mm-hmm. or the transnational corporations uh, that have interest in the food production system. So you find that uh, if you look at the conventional or industrial food production systems, the seeds are in the hands of a very few multinational corporations that uh, seek to put the farmers into the perpetual system of buying seeds every time they want to plant and um, if you look at even the the global seed laws mm-hmm. if you look at the maybe UPA of 91 for example that actually criminalizes uh, small scale farmers or farmers from sharing the seed from selling the seeds if you look at the, the some of the international treaties these treaties actually s- tend to support the multinational corporations but they criminalize the farmers way or, or the farmer managed seed systems but uh, the good news is that also uh, movements like the Kenyan Peasant League La Via Campesina mm-hmm. we have several movements even in Kenya who have now started to to seek for seed sovereignty by establishing seed banks by tra- training farmers on how to bank seeds at the household level and this is one of the ways that uh, we are doing to be able to emancipate ourselves from the the bondage that we are being put into by the transnational corporations yeah so we have got the industrial seeds but also now we have the farmer managed seed systems that we advocate for yeah maybe to clarify what do you mean by the international treaties are meant to criminalize farmers yeah you see, if you look at for example we have got the international plant treaty mm-hmm. uh, which uh, the, the international treaty on plant genetic resources and for food and agriculture or the plant treaty you look at there are some provisions there that uh, basically prohibit farmers and support the multinationals who produce seeds mm-hmm. but there is article 9 of that treaty mm-hmm. which talks about the farmers rights it talks about uh, the farmers uh, should be free to exchange their seeds to bank their seeds to sell their seeds but the catch situation is that they are they they are giving the governments the responsibility to develop legislations uh, that will come for the realization of the farmers rights as, as article 9 and that's why i'm lucky because i'm part of the ad hoc technical expert group for farmers Mm-hmm. FAO mm-hmm. and uh, the the work of the expert group is to be able to develop options for realization of, of the farmers rights. Two years ago we were in Rome and uh, mm-hmm. uh, t- trying to s- come up with options uh, and an inventory of good practices on how to realize farmers rights. But we realized that the multinationals also are part of this expert group and yeah. they are very powerful. Yeah. So the more we are trying to push for countries like Kenya uh, to be able to come up with laws to support farmers rights, you still look at the seeds and plant varieties act in Kenya it's still based on the UPA of 91 that prohibits that criminalizes farmers from selling their seeds from sell from from backing their seeds mm-hmm. we are still having things like the food crop regulations that uh, was talking about stopping farmers from selling s- foods uh, from in their farms so those are some of the treaties that are, are, are the inter- even regionally we have got the East African seeds harmonization laws mm-hmm. which again is based on the if we look at the Kenyan seeds and plant varieties act it's copy paste mm-hmm. so so the Kenyan seeds and plant varieties act is copy paste of people of 91 and then the East African Seeds and Plant Varieties Act bill sorry is again copy so some of those regional laws and international treaties 
they are not they are being developed without the participation of farmers mm-hmm. and that's why the issues of farmers are not in those tre- in are, are those cities. Yeah. so we also have got the peace and side declaration which was uh, passed in 2018 mm-hmm. article 19 of the declaration actually talks about again farmers rights but again this is uh, it's not a binding document mm-hmm. so it depends on the governments to be able to implement. so that's why we need to have a stronger voice to push our governments to be able to implement some of those provisions There are hundreds of seed vaults across nearly every country in the world. Has that improved farmers' access and affordability to the wide variety of seeds? No, because we find that uh, first of all, some of those seed vaults, mm-hmm. who owns them? That's a question. And you find that they are not owned by farmers because when we talk about seed sovereignty, we talk about ownership of the seeds. The farmers must be at the center. But if you look at those seed vaults, the f- seeds are collected from the farmers' varieties. And you see once they are in the vaults yeah uh-huh. the procedure for accessing it itself is tiresome and those are some of the issues that I, we are trying to address in the expert group because one you, you, you look at, for example there was a push uh, two, year, two years ago in 2018 uh, during the global governing body of FAO uh, they wanted to expand the list of plant varieties that are in the vaults mm-hmm. but what we are saying is this now we, uh, we what we have to address is the accessibility if you come to a farm and get a, a variety of, of of plant or seeds that farmers have been keeping for millions of years and then you take it and then now you will be able to these farmers for them to plant it they have to buy it from you or pay for the patents so this they are not accessible to farmers farmers don't access them in fact farmers don't even know where they exist in the first place if you ask mm-hmm. any farmer in Kenya you go to go to Migori county for example and ask them do you know where we have a seed but they tell you we don't what is that so if people don't even know where they exist it means they're not accessible and affordability it's still the same it's not affordable you, you, you go to agrovets for example the, which is the, are, are locally available you find that they are not affordable they are farmers the other time we saw farmers in a place called really demonstrating that they can't access the seeds in fact during covid uh, when the global supply chain was disrupted yeah. there are farmers who did not could not have seeds and we received a lot of calls uh, from farmers uh, telling us because we have seed banks as Kenya Peasant League mm-hmm. they, we received increased call for seeds people tell us can we get even, even as as late as last week we have still receiving farmers from Kitui telling us we want this particular maize breed of seed so they are they are not affordable they are not affordable for the farmers i believe multinationals as you have said they play a very big part in controlling seeds do you think they have contributed to to our farming food and farming systems positively or negatively negatively because one uh, you know when you talk about food sovereignty mm-hmm. we are talking about the farmer and the consumer being at the center taking control of the food production system from the land water seed distribution and market mm-hmm. because food sovereignty does not only end with the farmer but it starts with the farmer and ends with the, the consumer needs to know what they are, grow, they are they, what food they are eating mm-hmm. now the multinationals are not are not contributing positively to the farm, the food systems that we have they are contributing mm-hmm. negatively because if you do not have the promote contract farming for example mm-hmm. whereby uh, farmers are, are are pushed to grow crops for export we had a situation i think it was in around some, uh, kitale where some group of farmers were, were made to grow at, i don't know I, i'm not very sure but they were they were growing food to be exported to eu market but the pesticides they used are banned in eu so after the farmers and was that really exported it, they, they, they they didn't export so the farmers grew the food the food is not cannot be consumed in the local market then when they were exported they told no the, the pesticides they used are banned in the eu so yeah. the farmers had, went to a very big loss so you find that that is actually a negative contribution to our food system because on the contrary what we push as the campus and league and uh, other movements is we must produce for the local market yeah such that you know those farmers they they grew food that even the local consumers don't know about you see so it means that you, when the when the, <laughs> they could not go to the eu market they yeah. could even sell it in the local market because they don't know it so that is actually a, a negative contribution again another negative contribution of 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 this is the fact that um, the systems they use the system they use to produce food is chemical herbicide intensive yeah which exposes our farmers to diseases destroys the soil and do you blame that to the seeds because oh. i've had an argument that indigenous seeds are actually very resistant to yes, pest so- Oh, compared to yeah, yes of course you mm-hmm. see if you look at even the process of producing these seeds itself 
you see, we can start from that point. Mm-hmm. Well, the process of producing these industrial seeds, uh, it is actually fossil fuel intensive, which contributes to climate change. And that climate change is what actually destroys the weather and it destroys the soil. And that's why you find that those soils will continuously need these this fertilizers, mm-hmm. chemical herbicides. So the seeds are, are related actually to that. Because you find that when you plant some particular seeds, it comes. Look at the, for example, I want to give an example of the, uh, there was a facility, I think it was the EU East African Economic Partnership Agreement, mm-hmm. where they, yeah, the EU actually gave some grants and loans to farmers and they, they were coming with conditions that you get these seeds you must use these herbicides you see oh. so you see they come hand in hand yeah yes yes is there any positive impact that has come out of commercialized seed systems uh, maybe it is positive in the pockets of the multinationals that make profit <laughs> yeah but not for the farmers because you find that most of the multinationals promote single or mono cropping Mm-hmm. So, so there's also genetic erosion, you see. The knowledge that the farmers have been having regarding food production. Because you look at seed, it starts with seed. Even cooking starts with the seed. So, you know, if you look at if you go, if you look at the international seed laws, when they're talking about varieties mm-hmm. and the way the farmers talk about varieties, in, for farmers, varieties is a population of different species. If you look at the, the requirement to register a seed in the vaults, as we're talking about, mm-hmm. the distinction of uniformity and standards. So it means that the seeds must, must conform to a particular standard. Why, when you go to Migori or, or Machakos or Baringo, you will find different species of sorghum, for example, mm-hmm. or different species of maize. So when you tell these farmers to register this so that they be distinct, they must be uniform, they must, must meet some standards, then we are losing a lot of knowledge in the yeah. process. Even cooking knowledge, because we find that if you don't if you don't know, if you have not even seen the maize, you won't know how to cook ugali. Yeah, even culture. Even culture. So yeah. there, a, lot of, a lot is being lost by commercialization of seeds. And that's why what we have been saying is that food should be removed from trade. Mm-hmm. Because when you when you put food in trade, then it, it becomes a, a factor of supply and demand, and, uh, and now people have to make profit. Yeah. So you find that uh, when you are planting maize, and there's a company in the US or somewhere else that needs biofuel from maize, so you are competing. Our bellies are competing with factories. And you so see sad. the market system, you will definitely go for where you get the higher price. Yeah. So the issue is not, there's no food. The issue is that the system that we have is not supporting food production that is to for livelihoods, but is for profit. Yeah. yeah. See, th- this brings us to another conversation about GMOs. Yes. Yeah, GMO seeds, which you have spoken about mm. before. Yes. Uh, do you think Kenya is really ready for GMOs? Well, Kenya is not ready because if you look at, uh, I think it, is, it was in 2012, uh, uh-huh. then Minister for Public Health, Beth Mugu, mm-hmm. uh, now she's an Omer senator, she established a task force uh, to review and evaluate the scientific information on mm-hmm. the safety of GMOs mm-hmm. uh, on human health. Mm-hmm. And the report was released in 2013. Mm-hmm. And in brief, mm-hmm. the report said that there was need to conduct further studies uh, to be able to establish uh, the the effects, the negative effects mm-hmm. that, uh, uh, that 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 the GMOs have uh, on 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 uh, on the human yes. on human life. Yeah. And it recommended. It made some recommendations. It said it said that even when the Kenya Kenya is conducting studies on GMO, it mm-hmm. must be supported by taxpayers not by companies that have interest. Mm. And it said that it must be done by Kenyan scientists. It must be done in an open and transparent manner. And uh, it also it also recommended uh, that there was need to uh, develop guidelines for testing of GMO mm-hmm. safety in regard to human health. And it also talked about um, enhancing the infrastructural capacity and human capacity of maybe NBA, for example, mm-hmm. to carry out tests in-house. You see? Yeah. So uh, we have seen recently, we have seen a push uh, by the Kenyan government to lift GMOs, especially during right now we are hearing about BT cotton, yeah, uh, GM cassava, cassava uh, and we are talking. We are, they are saying that you know now that Corona has disrupted food. Now we need GMOs to be able to feed people. Countries like South Africa went GMO maize, but they still hunger in South Africa. You see, if if South Africa now which has accepted GMO, for example, if everybody would have been feeding there. So even if you bring GMOs, but this distribution system is still based on profit. Yeah. So the issue is. The issue is it's not about food is not available, it's about distribution. 70% of FAO, I say 70% of food on the table globally is produced by small scale farmers. Mm-hmm. But what amount of investments from government goes to small scale farmers? They're on their own. Yeah. So if they're on their own, they can be able to contribute 70% of, of food on the table. Then it means with little support. But now the government, instead of investing in research on how to promote organic production, they're investing taxpayers' money in researching on GMOs. So GMOs basically, to, uh, from our opinion, uh, we, we, we are still not ready 
because if you look at the, the the systems of farms we have in Kenya, for example, mm-hmm. if you are my neighbor and you are planting GMOs and I'm planting local maize, there's pollination, for example. Yeah. And there we have had farmers, uh, groups like Bear, which bought Monsanto, Syngenta. We have seen them uh, in some countries sending people to the fields to come and test whether because those GMOs are patented. So if you are planting your maize and I'm also planting my maize mm-hmm. here and there's pollination, you'll be arrested. Are we able to, to do that? How, are we able to control which yeah. areas are, are, are going? We have countries, I think, in South America which have tested and say we have GMO regions and non-GMO regions. But it still, it still doesn't work because if you are saying, if, you are, if today guy Kenya said Machakos is a GMO region, you have a right to choose. The yeah. system of food products. So those systems systems Actually, cannot yeah. work. Yeah. So we are, to me, I think uh, we are still not ready because the government has not been able to, to to tell us specifically the effects of the GMOs. They have not been able to tell us that. So Kenya is not ready, and uh, we want uh, instead the Kenyan government to be able to focus on supporting indigenous food production system. Look at the Galana Kulala, for example. Yeah. Huge amounts of money. The first of all, it was costed around 50, uh, 15 billion. It was inflated. Then it, it was reduced to around 7 billion. Maize was planted. Where is it? If that money would have gone to support extension services, to support farmers, to train them on how they can be able to manage food production, to develop land races. Because, you know, farms are big laboratories. Yeah. Farmers have been testing this thing. They have been researching. They have been breeding in open spaces, but with no support. So if that money would have gone to support the small scale farmers, we have been actually... And lastly, look at during COVID. Mm-hmm. We, as Kenya Peasant League, we got support uh, from uh, organizations like the Agro- Agroecology Fund, mm-hmm. uh, War on Want, and because we had farmers who are our members, and we also have members in Nairobi who are consumers. So we were saying some of them lost jobs. So we were trying to distribute seed to get maize or food from our farmers in Migori, for example, to Nairobi, to get a license to be able during that time. It was maybe the cheapest one was, was 15,000 shillings or $150. Now, which farmer can be able to get that license? Nobody. Yeah, nobody. So the, 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 the issue is that people are not hungry because there's no food. People are angry because the food, the, the farmer managed food system or seed system has been criminalized You are uh, such that even for you to be able to transport that particular food, mm-hmm. it becomes very expensive. So you find that if you go to a place like Oyugis or you go to a place like Asembo where, when, or even in, in uh, Eastern, where when farmers harvest bananas or they harvest cassava, it is it flashes the market and therefore the the, the the prices goes down. While across there are people in Trukana who don't have food. But why can't we be able to support a distribution system that links the farmers and the consumers Consistent, directly? Yeah. And that's what we are talking about alternative economy and trade. Several studies mm. Actually, we're moving to something else, yes. specifically on biodiversity, because yes, yes. our food, our food yeah. from the food production mm. level, mm. we definitely need mm. the biodiversity to ensure mm. we are food secure. Mm. And several studies have shown 40% of global biodiversity mm. risks extinction, mm. including several key plant, plant species. Mm. What does this portend for seed preservation and seed sovereignty? It's actually, it's true because you find that um, the, the whole globe is actually mm-hmm. being supported by a, a close around 15 species of either plants and animals. Mm-hmm. And, we, and that's what I was talking about earlier because the, uh, biodiversity erosion mm-hmm. is being promoted by these multinational companies. Mm-hmm. Because when you come and tell us that uh, we are coming up with a grant to support farmers, but you must, you must only grow sugarcane. <laughs> You see, yeah. these are farmers who used to grow different species of, of cassava, mm-hmm. of, of vegetables, of everything. Eh? So it definitely, it, it, prob- it, it actually, uh, we're talking about biodiversity erosion. We even knowledge erosion because, they know, as I said earlier, it starts from seed. When you plant a seed, mm-hmm. if it is, for example, black nightshade, for example, mm-hmm. you plant it, there's knowledge of planting it or propagating it of weeding, of harvesting, and of cooking it. All this knowledge is lost when you promote monocropping. We have countries like, for example, in um, in Mozambique, for example, where there's mm-hmm. a company called ProSavanna that came and said, now we want to promote eucalyptus farming. And you see, even in Kenya, you find people saying, now we, we, we plant eucalyptus, and then we buy a paper of collapses, and you have planted eucalyptus in your whole farm. Can you eat eucalyptus? But you can't <laughs> eat it, even if you plant sugarcane. Yeah. Will you eat two again when you're hungry? Even if you plant coffee or tea, will you eat it? Yeah. That's why you find that, um, the, 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 and I said that the farmers, to us, varieties, farmer varieties, constitutes a population of different species of plants. And those wide range of plants, if you push for monocropping, then you lose a lot of we, we, we risk losing that and yeah. in, in the near future we'll find a situation whereby now you have to depend on, on Monsanto 
seeds because you don't have it. And they can decide, okay, now this year we aren't producing seeds. We will be bringing junk food. That means we'll all be hungry. Yeah. Exactly. So they create market for for the junk foods because now if I'm the only supplier of seeds and I, I say I, 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 it's a private business, you cannot take me anywhere. Yeah. I said now this year I want to rest. <laughs> I will not produce seeds anymore. But uh, ah, what will we eat? Then okay, we will bring you maybe junk food to eat. So we actually are in a bad shape, but the good news is that uh, globally, farmers are organizing themselves. They are creating community seed banks. They're creating household seed banks to be able to, they're starting to collect various seeds that are in the wild, bring them back. But in a cube, they're doing this, but it is still criminalized. You see, yeah. but they're doing it. And now, and they are doing it, they are not, it's, it's, it's not supported. By the, and that's why even right now, there's mm-hmm. need, there's need for looking at all the Crops Act, the Seeds, Plant and Rights Act, all, all these regulations, mm-hmm. to look at them and try to see in which which sections are actually uh, affecting the farmers and to amend them. It seems there's so much mm. conversation about seeds. As we wind down CD, mm. what is your take on seed patents held by both private, public and individual entities across the globe? Patents are criminal, for lack of a better word, mm-hmm. they are demonic. Because how do you patent uh, lifestyle? For example, you, you can you patent a human being because patenting a seed is just patenting a human being. Say a patented, you know, it's it's criminal. And if you look at the agreements on agriculture in WTO, if you look at the uh, the uh, the trade the, the, the trips, the trade related mm-hmm. intellectual property agreements, all those ones are promoting patents. And that's why I mentioned about UPO of ninety one, which again, uh, you know, union of protection of plant varieties. Mm-hmm. You see, we're protecting them from who? You see, the farmers have been having these seeds. And by the way, uh, these multinationals, they still come to the farmers' varieties. They cannot create them from nowhere. Yeah. You see, the farmers have been having them. And if these farmers have been having this plant, for keeping them from generation to generation, and then now we want to patent it so that now this farmer can be able to apply to be allowed to use that, that is not, that, that is a quote unfair. It's criminal. And it's, that's why we are saying that if you look at WTO, it's it, it's not promoting farmers. It prohibits even investment in, a, it, it prohibits subsidies. If you look at the countries like US, they are subsidizing their farmers. Mm-hmm. But our countries, due to sub- structural adjustment programs by World Bank and IMF, you are told to de- reduce public expenditure. And reduction of public expenditure means reduction of supporting farmers. Who is being given space there is the multinational. So our farmers, if you look at, that's why we say, mm-hmm. if our farmers produce for the global market, they are losing it because you cannot compete with the farmer in the US who has been subsidized. Yeah. And that's why we are saying let farmers produce for the local market. Look at during COVID, the CS agriculture said that you see, we are going to import maize from outside Kenya to bridge the gap of COVID while we have maize farmers in Kenya. So the, the loan they got from World Bank had that condition that have are, to you have to import yeah. it. So what happens to our farmers? Our so farmers. if our farmers now, we have now to reorient them to start producing for the local market. And um, uh, so that now, when you when you plant that brenda or when you plant that cassava, mm-hmm. your neighbor knows cassava, you know, they mm-hmm. will be able to come and buy it from you. And that's why we, uh, we, are, we are promoting uh, uh, territorial markets, for example. Look at even during the COVID, most markets were closed. Yet, yeah. Yet supermarkets were opened. You see, so markets were opened. <laughs> yeah. Some some of the supermarkets even carry many people. If you go to a mall, how many people go, go into a mall? But the markets where the small scale farmers can go are closed. People are being tear gassed. In a window, for example, people uh, people went to sell their um, livestock market. People were tear gassed. People lost their animals because people everybody was running away. So you look at that. While so it's a class system, and that's why we are saying that the only way that we can be able, the government now needs to support small scale food production for the local market because that is the only way can be able to uh, look at the and tea, for example, yeah. mm-hmm. in the global market. Why is it? You know, they have quarters. You can only sell this much. Look at all that huge... Pub. So farmers have grown tea. I come from a window. Farmers were pushed into growing sugarcane. Now, in the 90s, when I was growing, it, it would take 16 months. You harvest your first crop. In two, in three weeks, you get your money. Mm-hmm. Today, it's, it goes even to three years. Why? Why do you grow sugarcane? Yet, there's cheap import of sugar. And they actually grew the sugar cane for export purposes. Even if it's for even yeah. if it's for for export, uh-huh. if already we're importing, then we're exporting to who? You see, because why do you, do you tell farmers? Look at Mumias, one of the biggest companies collapsed. Yeah. So how many of those farmers? There are farmers who have not even been paid to date. Look at Sony in Awendo. They are now selling it. You see, mm-hmm. when Sony came, they 
took public land because they didn't come with the land. They, they, they took public land. Now they are selling the company plus the land. And what we are saying is that you didn't come with the land. Sell your machines and go. Let the lands go back to the, to the people. But now they are saying, you see, now they were, we're having a... So that's yeah. the idea of privatization. So we are saying, don't grow cash crop. If those people in Europe want to to to, uh, to make cloth, let them grow cotton. We should not grow cotton for them to go and make cloth. Yeah. There. Yeah. So let's grow what we can be able to eat. Once we are food sovereign, mm-hmm. then we can be able to think about. But if you are hungry, my friend, you, will you even think? So let's grow for the local market and for the immediate market. Let farmers let us create systems like in KPL or in LVC where we create we link farmers to consumers directly. We are forming now uh, com- community supported agriculture whereby instead of keeping your money in a bank. You see, yeah. which is maybe owned by another multinational, we create these food cooperatives whereby now you can keep your money in that cooperative. Mm-hmm. The farmer can be able to access that money, even if it is a loan in a, in a savvy credit way at a cheaper interest. They can grow food and then you, you you will be able to get draw your food from that place. So we are creating those systems to be able to ensure that we support. It's a way of creating community banks to, to start coming up with a, an alternative food production system that is based on the provision of livelihoods. Asante City, we've mm. come to the end of our show. Thank you. Do you have any closing remarks? Well, the closing remarks I would say is that uh, the people are listening uh, to this uh, interview. Mm-hmm. They need to know that... Uh, most of the government policies that relate to seeds, to food, are not being developed by our own lawmakers. They are being developed by people who have interest. For example, the multinationals who come with loans, and our governments have got a, an appetite for loan. You see, <laughs> so when they when they give you the loan, they tell you now you don't allow farmers to sell their foods. Don't allow this. So it is high time uh, the farmers started organizing themselves, start collecting the indigenous seeds that you had. If you have your grandmother who is still alive, those older people, try asking them. Try let us create community banks, seed banks. Let us create community sales solidarity funds. Let us try to see how we link with the consumers directly instead of using the middlemen and women. I really like that. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, CD, for sharing with us this information about seeds and for also giving us a call to action, which I believe most of our listeners will act to it. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. See you again next week on Friday for more exciting conversations. Follow us on SoundCloud at Chakula Podcast. Like, share, and leave us a comment. If you have any queries, feel free to write to us on info at foodtofood.org. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts at Chakula Podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review. Bye.